So it's the end of 2018, which means I am contractually obligated to make a top 10 video for all the games that came out in this year, despite the fact that I haven't made a video in half a year. But that's besides the point, because I want to talk to you about a lot of things, uh, and things that I liked, uh, and 10 of them in order in a ranked list. Because that's just what I enjoy doing. So I'm going to do that. I also want to give a quick shout out before we begin to Valkyria Chronicles 4 and Dead Cells. Two games that I haven't really finished and haven't played enough of really to give a full judgment on to whether they would be in my top 10 list. They probably would be. They'd probably maybe be around the lower end. But just shout out to those games because I thought they were really cool. Also, Red Dead isn't on this list because fuck the controls in that game. Anyway, let's start with the top 10. Here we go. Bloodstained Curse of the Moon. Back in 2015, I backed Bloodstained Ritual of the Night, which was a pseudo successor to the Castlevania franchise from series veteran Koji Igarashi. Little did I know that we'd be getting an NES style sprite based spin off release before the actual game itself. You see, Bloodstained Curse of the Moon is a triumph in returning to a classic NES Castlevania. Everything from movement to enemy design is so shamelessly on full display. It feels great to seamlessly switch between the four characters on the fly, adding a modern dynamic to the classic formula. And their various weapons, from the free spells to the whips to a cloud of bats, are all unique and all suited to different scenarios. The level design, with its branching paths and tight corridors of traps and enemies, feels devious and yet perfectly right. In many ways, this game is a love letter to the past, but it also adds a lot of conveniences that a game like this sorely needs. There's an easy mode without a live system, and it reduces knockback. There's also paths that are clearly more difficult and are there for the pure challenge of the hardcore player. It balances for both spectrums, and succeeds because of it. I personally breezed through on easy to see everything, before going back for the more traditional experience that had me pulling my hair out on quite a few occasions. Despite this being a shorter, lower budget spin-off, in many ways it may end up being the better game than the one which was kickstarted, but I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Octopath Traveler. I was quite frankly knocked off my feet when I played the demo for Octopath Traveler. It was everything I wanted. An amazing pixel art style that was modernized and blended with 3D backgrounds and modern lighting effects, an astonishing soundtrack that rivaled the best I had heard in JRPGs, and I had a pair of opening chapters that, while leaning on particular tropes, were so well voice acted and written that I was instantly invested. It is unfortunate then that this game wasn't able to climb higher on my list. It's, it's actually really frustrating, because despite the fact that individual elements of Octopath are so strong, it's the overall structure and cohesion that holds it back. In all honesty, the world just feels like a menu. No town feels unique or special, as they all comprise the same shops, the same shallow NPCs, and a mix of either snowy, wooded, or desert environments for flavour. Travelling between them is more of a chore than a delight. I really wanted to have a space to explore, you know, but the linear corridors offer only the most meagre of rewards for stepping briefly off their paths. I personally wasn't overly bothered by the lack of narrative threads tying all the characters together, as this game felt like each story was personal and, and self-contained and not about world-ending catastrophes, which was frankly quite refreshing. But it was those gaps between the story threads where things really broke down. The fact that you have to grind every character individually, and to such a ridiculous degree that it could be four hours until you're able to do another story mission. It really hurt the pacing, and meant that I only finished four of the eight stories the game offers. Despite all this, I cannot fault some aspects of Octopath Traveler. It stays on this list because its soundtrack is simply phenomenal, and its battle system is such a dynamic reinvention of your standard turn-based affair asking you to pay close attention to turn order, and making sure you are prepared to deal massive damage when the opportunity presents itself. If they ever make a sequel to this game, and it's pretty likely given how well it's sold, they could refine this core and make this into something very special. As it stands, I really enjoyed it, and think I uh, should probably give it a go. The Messenger Nintendo Directs are great for so many reasons, but one of my favourite aspects of them is their ability to highlight smaller games that I've never heard of and that speak directly to a Nintendo audience. That is what happened with The Messenger, the debut effort from indie developer Sabotage Studio, a game which many were calling the Shovel Knight of this year. In many ways it shares similarities with Shovel Knight, being very openly inspired by classic Nintendo games, but maintaining modern game design philosophies and ideas. 
However, it adds an additional twist that makes it even more interesting, as throughout the game you gain the ability to switch between two different art styles, 8-bit and 16-bit. This not only shifts the colour palette, sprite work and music, but changes the way you traverse the levels, and is needed to solve puzzles and platforming challenges alike. The game is a platformer at its heart though, and those linear levels with Ninja Gaiden-esque movement and abilities were what spoke to me the most. It just feels so amazing to jump and slice at enemies, and the addition of the cloud step, a move where if you hit an enemy or projectile or object in midair, you gain an extra jump, is genius. It offers so many possibilities for skipping over sections and speeding through areas without even touching the ground, and feels so damn good to execute. Though, it may take a while to get your head around. I do feel that the game gets overly long by its conclusion, and the shift in gameplay style about halfway through is something that I thought I would be a fan of, but ultimately felt quite undercooked. The backtracking was hampered by an awful fast travel system, and the levels just didn't feel like they were meant to be traversed multiple times. That said, it is a tremendously well-made game, and sports my favourite soundtrack of the year. Yeah, that's right, better than Octopath Traveler, motherfucker, I said it! Dragon Quest XI. Here is what I did every time I got to a new town in Dragon Quest XI. Looked at my map, made a mental route of where I was going to start and where I was going to end, then I walked around and methodically talked to every NPC, broke every barrel, read every bookshelf, and admired each painstakingly made environment. Dragon Quest XI is a game that expects you to take it slow, but unlike Red Dead Redemption 2, it doesn't force you to. The protagonist this time can run really fast and even get a horse if he wants, as well as jump. This makes exploration feel so much more tangible than before, even if there are still hard limitations on where you can go. There is such a warmth to these environments and characters that I felt obligated to bathe in it. This exploration also acts as a primer for the story to come, as books you read and NPCs you talk to will give hints towards characters you're about to meet and events that are about to happen. It builds history without feeling overwhelming and adds charm to a game that is already brimming with it. Nothing is more charming than the cavalcade of monsters you will come across. Akira Toriyama's art style is something I've always been a fan of, but the glory of it in HD and the fluidity of animation for every creature is truly stunning. Even the names are amazing. Sign me up to smash a lump wizard in the head any day. So much about Dragon Quest XI is traditional, and yet it still manages to surprise. The crafting system is so much better than before and has a mini game that is shockingly fun and challenging. Every party member gains XP from battles and they can even be switched out on the fly, even if they've been taken down in combat. You can now zoom anywhere, even if you're inside, so no more bonking your head on stupid ceilings. These modern conveniences combined with great story twists and a simple yet refined battle system makes Dragon Quest XI the ultimate traditional JRPG and a comforting adventure to relax into after a long day. Super Smash Brothers Ultimate! Super Smash Brothers is an event, and none more so than this game, which, having been revealed at the start of this year, how is that even possible by the way, has been an unending hype train that has choo-chooed its way into becoming one of the fastest selling Nintendo games ever. It is frankly ridiculous that we live in a world where you can play as Cloud, a me dressed up as Dunban, Pichu, and motherfucking Ridley. Seriously? Why? Like, why is this possible? But despite its extravagant character roster, ludicrous stage selection, and absurdly enormous soundtrack, Smash Bros. Ultimate is certainly a flawed game. Don't get me wrong, the smashing is as good as it's ever been, building off the foundation of the Wii U game and adding hundreds of little changes that add up to create something I'll be playing online for years and years. But it is so much of the heart of Smash Bros. that has been lost, Trophies are my biggest sticking point. They were my reason, my go-to for doing most of the single-player content in a Smash Brothers game. You got those fucking awesome ones for doing all-star mode, you could spend your coins on incredible 3D models of places and characters, all with accompanying text that talked about the history. The Wii U game did this so well, having cabinets that really gave that sense of Smash Brothers as a museum of Nintendo history. But now what do we have? fucking spirits. JPEGs of over a thousand characters from all over Nintendo history. Now how do we even know who they are? There's, there's no information about them, no way to gain a deeper insight or understanding into that history. When I started playing Smash with Melee, I had hardly played any Nintendo franchises, and slowly but surely over time, I got familiar with Fire Emblem, and Star Fox, and F-Zero, 
all through the lens of this amazing collection of the past. And now that's all gone. Shame as it is, World of Light is a tribute in other ways, with certain fights being downright hilarious. Fighting a teeny tiny Game & Watch representing Buzz Buzz from Earthbound is brilliant. Classic mode is also more tailored and much faster to blast through, but with these two modes comprising the majority of the single player offering, it's hard not to feel disappointed. But as I said, at the end of the day, still Smash Brothers and any Smash Brothers is a good time in my book. I'm already starting to learn Rick de Belmont, and I cannot wait to find out who will join Joker from Persona 5 in the upcoming DLC. Smash Brothers is about the hype, and as long as they keep bringing that, this train ain't never leaving the tracks. Into the Breach I've come to the realisation over the past few years that I tend to not enjoy difficult games unless they're in certain genres. One of those genres is strategy games. I adored the challenge of Valkyria Chronicles and Fire Emblem Fates Conquest, and the way they force you to be tactical by making tough choices. Into the Breach is the perfect distillation of the most intense moments of those types of games. It gives you three mechs on an 8x8 grid and asks you to fend off waves of bugs, and more important than just clearing the map, survive. You see, this game is so much more than just a roguelike strategy game. It makes movement and placement so important, giving you the tools to maneuver your units to block hits, stop enemies from spawning, use the environment and even their own units against them. I've had turns where escape seemed impossible, where I was outnumbered and outgunned and saw no way out. But after taking time and thinking and going through every possibility, I came to a solution where not only everyone survived, but I cleared the objective and then some. What you come to learn about this game is that while it often seems unfair and impossible, each scenario is finely tuned so that you always have a chance. It is rare that a roguelike game gives you the feeling that something is hand designed, but Into the Breach constantly pulls it off, from the varied environments and hazards of each island to the unique objectives, I never felt like maps were randomly stuck together pieces of an algorithm. The other thing that makes it so eminently replayable is the fact that every team of mechs feels so different. One may rely on dealing damage with a giant laser beam that hits every enemy in a line, another may be more melee focused, forcing you to smack enemies into one another to gain additional damage. Not to mention the fact that there are three different difficulty levels, multiple ways to finish the game depending on how many islands you've completed, and a multitude of achievements that contribute to unlocking other teams of mechs. You, my friend, have a package that will continue to scratch your strategy edge. Oh, and it also taps into another one of my weaknesses, gorgeous pixel art. It really is a masterclass in design, and I couldn't recommend it more highly. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 Torna the Golden Country Over the years, it has become clear to me that the way Monolith Soft designs their game speaks to me on a very personal level. The standalone expansion for Xenoblade Chronicles 2, Torn of the Golden Country, doesn't do anything revolutionary. The story is predictable, being a prequel, not all the locations are new, and there is certainly a hefty amount of bloat with the forced side quests at the end. But they have refined everything so much that it feels like a perfection of this particular formula. The combat is the best it's ever been in a Xenoblade game. Getting rid of some of the more complex aspects and distilling it down so that you're only ever switching between a handful of blades and each one having a clear purpose. I love the way timed button presses work into the system, and the way it rewards you with faster combos and building your chain attacks. It also means that I'm never avoiding battles while I'm exploring, as the combat is just so satisfying. I just want to go and run around and smash things with my big hammer. But the running around is the real heart of this game. The soundtrack is astonishingly good, and that combined with the breadcrumbing of little shiny areas where you just go along and you click them, and you run around and it makes a good noise, and you collect the ingredients for your recipes, items for quests, it just makes it so that Torna is a game I bathe in. Literal hours can disappear as you just wander the open expanse, ticking off collectibles and side quests and just soaking everything in. The new continent of Torna is varied in its locales, and while it is far more split up into sections than the more open expanse of a place like Gormot, each one is unique. Particular standouts are the large capital city and the sunlit beaches that precede it. It's weird because Torna is pretty much more of the same and doesn't do anything groundbreaking, but I've come to realise that I don't need much else from a game like this. It is more than the sum of its parts, and I appreciate it with all its flaws. Marvel's Spider-Man 
I really wasn't anticipating Marvel Spider-Man to be as good as it is. I knew that Insomniac would nail the movement after their experience with Sunset Overdrive, but I didn't think the game would go much beyond that. Boy, was I wrong. This may be my favourite superhero story in any medium. Now granted, I'm hardly a comic book fan and most of my experience with this stuff comes from the MCU, but the fact that Insomniac outdid the majority of those blockbuster movies with their story is not something I thought would happen. It's the simple stuff like the conversations Peter has with MJ or the relationship that he builds with Miles and Aunt May. It's the way that they seamlessly fit a cavalcade of villains that could be spread across multiple games into one. It's the interstitial conversations that take place while you're swinging across the city goofing off with Yuri about Spider Cop or tuning into J. Jonah Jameson's podcast. All these narrative elements are so well considered, and the performances are fantastic as well. Yuri Lernthal and Laura Bailey disappear into their characters, and despite the fact that I know their voices so well, it never took me out of the narrative. Also, swinging is good. Like, really fucking good? I, I mean, I don't know that movement has ever felt this amazing in a video game, and it's, it's so damn frictionless. There's not really any challenge to it, but that's something that I appreciate because going from place to place is just involved enough to feel awesome, but not so involved that it becomes a chore. The unlocks that allow you to boost off buildings and trick midair are great additions to an already amazing system. The combat is perhaps the game's biggest flaw for me, but it's still very entertaining. You do get to a point where you stick to a default set of moves and it was frustrating that the game never forced me into using all the amazing gadgets that it throws at you, but it all looks so fluid and amazing that it carried me through to the end. Insomniac has made a game that sets up so much and makes a hell of a gambit for the beginnings of a Marvel gaming universe that I could not be more excited about. God of War. Rebooting a franchise is hard. It takes a lot of guts to look at something successful and rip it down to build it back up again. Nintendo took such a risk last year with Breath of the Wild, and it paid off in dividends, and I believe that the same can be said of Sony Santa Monica in 2018 with God of War. This game is tremendous in so many ways. The choice of a Norse setting was genius, as the pantheon of gods is just recognisable enough for a modern audience while still having so much mystery surrounding it. It drew me into its world so expertly that I was inspired to find out more, and went so far as to read Neil Gaiman's book on Norse mythology just because it was so intriguing. But it was the scale of the game that really got my heart racing. From the awe-inspiring world serpent, to the moment when you get to the gate between realms and see the possibilities for all the crazy places you may go in this world, it constantly feels bigger and more ambitious than it has any right to be. Kratos' axe should win an award for how good it feels to use. Throwing that thing and being able to call it back to you whenever you want was an amazing design choice that forces creativity in combat as you switch between your fists and the axe and the various special moves that make up your arsenal. Not to mention Atreus, who adds another layer, allowing you to stun and grapple enemies to your heart's content. And that partnership is really at the heart of this game. The relationship between this father and son is so well realised as it gradually builds across the course of the game. It is mirrored in the way they fight together. There are so many amazing moments between the entire cast and there's a clear theme of broken families that threads through not only this game but Norse mythology itself. Characters like Brock, Sindri and Mimir are amazing and hilarious, offering a dose of humour to contrast the dourness of Kratos. But my favourite element of this game is the way that it feels so enormous and yet is so contained. The game is wide yet still linear, offering you the opportunity to do side quests in the large lake that comprises your base of operations but not overwhelming you with them, and giving them all a reason to exist that builds the narrative in subtle ways. It also has a healthy dose of environmental puzzle solving, mm, you know I like that, that while often uses the axe in similar ways, is so damn enjoyable to execute on that I went after every health and rage upgrade. Like Spider-Man, God of War sets up a universe that is so exciting and enticing that I can hardly wait to see what comes next. Celeste. Celeste is simply brilliant. I don't know that I've ever played a platformer that is not only impeccably designed, but also offers so much more. The way that Celeste fits its themes of anxiety and depression into a game which presents those ideas through its gameplay is seamless and masterful. It has characters that you care about and situations that you want to overcome. It makes the oh so cliched metaphor of climbing a mountain to conquer your fears feel genuine and impactful. 
The art is wonderful, with character portraits bringing the gorgeous sprites to life, and goofy Animal Crossing-esque voices adding an additional layer of charm. The polish is immaculate, with some of the most tight controls in any game I've ever played, and constant little embellishments into the animations and phenomenal sound design. But it is the core design of the game that is so amazing. Every screen follows this pattern. Have a go and die a bunch of times. Examine the challenge before you, figure out what it wants you to do. Once you've figured out the puzzle in your head, you need to figure it out with your fingers. Keep trying until you're dexterous enough to overcome it, complete the room and move on to the next. This loop of completing the challenge twice, first in your mind and then with your body, is not only immensely rewarding and satisfying, but it plays perfectly into the themes that the game wants to express, about coming to terms with your inner demons before overcoming them. Celeste is a very challenging game, but it's my kind of challenging. It has clearly learned from the Super Meat Boy school of design, with fast deaths and restarts, and with no punishment for doing so. The game even tells you not to care about how many deaths you've had, and to even be proud of them. This core of encouragement is so embedded into the heart of the story and the game itself that you never feel inadequate for failing over and over again. There are really only a couple of mechanics that you have at your disposal. The ability to dash midair, which you regain when you touch the ground, and the ability to cling to and climb walls. Yet Celeste does so much with so little. Each level has a certain gimmick that must be used in combination with these skills, whether it be space blocks that you zoom through or heavy winds that you fight against. Every single one is unique and adds another layer to the platform. Look, I could go on and on about this game, about how I played through the devilish B and C side levels that could practically be another game in their own right, or how the carefully considered yet motivating soundtrack got stuck in my head for weeks. But at its core, Celeste is about not giving up and I couldn't ask for a game that delivers that message more perfectly. Alright, well that is that for another year of video games. Hope you guys enjoyed this uh, and got some maybe good recommendations for things you may have missed out on in this year that came out on video game systems. Uh, let me know below what you think, what are your favourite games from 2018, all that good stuff, and uh, hopefully it won't be so long until I'll be back again doing another video. It takes time, look, it takes time and effort, but I do still enjoy doing this and I, I still will continue to, so thanks everyone uh, who is still here and, and watching and listening and all that good stuff, and I guess I'll see you guys soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>